Our scripture reading this morning comes from Luke's Gospel. We'll be reading from chapter 1, verses 57 through 66. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, none of your relatives has this name. Then they began to monitor his father to find out what name he wanted to give him. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And all of them were amazed. Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue freed and he began to speak, praising God. And fear came over all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about throughout the entire hill country of Judea. All who heard them pondered them and said, What then will this child become? For indeed the hand of the Lord was with him. I'm very happy to introduce you to Casey Alexander. Casey uh, is a minister with the UCC Church, but also uh, has standing in the Disciple Church. And uh, she is an old friend. We go all the way back to, what, late 1980s? Late 1980s in Oregon. Uh, when she was on the Regional Youth Council and I was one of the regional adult sponsors then. Uh, Casey has uh, grown in stature and spirit, as the Bible says, and uh, she has most recently been the pastor at the UCC Church in Weaverville, which is where we got how we got Corky. Yay! So we're very happy uh, for Casey's ministry. She is now in search and call, looking for another congregation. And I have invited her to come and preach during this third Sunday of Advent. Casey, welcome. Oops. It helps if I get my mic on again. Thank you, Jesse, and for all of you for inviting me to come and join you again. Uh, Jesse and I were just reminiscing with one of you in the back as, uh, before worship and saying, trying to figure out when I was last here, and um, the thing that jumped into my mind was I preached here, I think, for the first time around Halloween, and I did a sermon on the masks we wear. And I talked about that since I didn't know you all as a congregation, I wouldn't take the risk, but I ended up doing it in Weaverville. I preached the same sermon, reworked a little, and I preached it in my floor-length, strapless red gown. (laughs) Um, So I didn't come in my red gown. I do have my red on, though, I guess, in spirit. But it is good to be back with you. When I first saw a Sanctified Art theme for Advent this year, I thought the writers were spot on. How does a weary world rejoice? I don't know about you, but there are many days where I go, not again, or, oh my gosh, this too, right? (laughs) There are so many things, and I know you've probably talked about them. I don't want to belabor them, but I want to acknowledge the weariness. The weariness can come from so many different places. The news that bombards us, the newest shooting by an AR-15 that is ending lives too suddenly, women's right to have an abortion and choose what happens with their body is being taken away, our friends that have skin other than white are being rejected from the polls and unable to claim their voice as Americans, our children are being told what they can and can't read one thing after the other. And I imagine for most of you in the congregation, 
you have said to yourself a few times now, didn't we solve this? Didn't we march in the streets for all of this? Didn't we figure this out decades ago? We don't have the energy to do it again. So there's all that's going on in the world. There's also what is going on in our own lives. I imagine, looking at the congregation, most of you are retired. But I know, I know that for those of you that are retired, you sometimes are more busy than you were when you worked full time. So whether, whether you work, whether you are retired, you are busy out in the community, out in the world, doing good. You're working with others, you're collaborating. That's on top of raising children, raising grandchildren, supporting those around you. The other piece that I think can make us very weary, at least it does me, is the increasing speed of which technology changes, like overnight. And just when we learn a new program, guess what? There's a new iPhone, and it's changed all of its format, and we have no clue what to do. That makes us weary. And so I think for today, we need to acknowledge the weariness, but we don't we don't wallow in that. We don't stay there. And so we ask, how does a weary world rejoice? We can take our cues from Elizabeth and Zechariah. Remember that nine months ago, uh, according to the story you heard two weeks ago, <laughs> nine months ago, the angel Gabriel showed up to, Gab or to Zechariah and said, ah, good news, your wife Elizabeth is pregnant and will bear a son. And Zechariah, wanting to have clear answers, wanting to know all the facts, wanting, I love the wording from the, was it the call to worship, where, you know, we look in um, either or thinking. We want the answers, we don't want any uncertainty, we don't want any unknowns. And he said to the angel with a <clears throat> roll of the eyes, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> My wife is way past childbearing age. I am an elder priest in the church or in the synagogue, in the temples, and we can't raise another child, da 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 The list goes on, right? He is made unable to speak for nine months. We ourselves have to find ways to not speak. Maybe not for nine months, but in other ways. I like to think of Zacharias being unable, me, being made un, unable to speak as the first century version of taking a tech Sabbath, turning off our phones, our computers, the stuff that we carry on our person all the time, and we are expected to be uh, able to be reached at any hour of any day, of any week, of any year, of any month, every year. <laughs> that gets exhausting. So Zechariah has for us a reminder to pause. When talking about awe, awe is a deep feeling of connection, of reverential respect, and it often comes with fear, not always a scary fear, but a fear of the vastness, the greatness, something that is absolutely incredible. And it often comes with wonder as well. The good news is that awe is not only makes us feel connected to God, to all that is around us, awe is good for our health, our physical, mental, emotional, spiritual health. In fact, it is on the cutting edge of emotion research now. And from the research that has been conducted so far, the science tells us that awe is not just good, but it is actually critical to our physical and psychological well-being. See, awe encourages our bodies to release oxytocin, oxytocin, that hormone, that love hormone that bonds us, that creates trust between a mother and a child, a father and a child, between two friends or family members. Our heart rate slows down when we experience awe. It helps to increase digestion, and it makes our breathing deeper. 
also calms our vagal nerves. How many of you know about the vagal nervous system? A couple. Good. That's awesome. Our vagal nervous system is the fight or flight part of our nervous system. So when we, perceive, we, when we sense fear, either perceived or real fear, it tells us are we going to flee or are we going to stand and fight it, face it, right? So it calms that vagal nervous system. And Dr. Dashay Keltner, who is a psychologist at Cal Berkeley, says that awe seems to quiet the negative self-talk. So there we have it, the physical, the psychological, the emotional, the spiritual. Because when we are in awe, we can connect fuller, fuller, more fully, <laughs> more fully with God and with the world around us. So let's talk about awe for a minute. Take a moment and think of something that has brought you to a state of awe, where you stop in your tracks and you say, wow, that's incredible. I would venture to guess that most of us, but I don't want to assume everyone, that most of us thought of something major and life-changing. Maybe the birth of a child. If you are the mother giving birth in labor, hurts like nothing else, but it is a wonder. Or if you are someone that is in the delivery room with someone giving birth, to watch that miraculous process occur. Or maybe if you are a hiker coming to that, um, the ridge and looking at the first time to that mountain lake that you have walked into on foot carrying a 50-pound pack on your back. Or if you're like me, maybe the top of the Eiffel Tower, standing stories and stories and stories above the ground below and looking out at the Streets spanning from all different directions as far as you can see into the horizon. Those are the, I think, sometimes the easy things of moments of awe that we think of and that come to mind. But there are so many ways that we can be in awe. The little things, every day. And the thing is, in order to be in awe, we have to pay attention. And so that tech Sabbath, as one example, is a way to let go of all the distractions and be present in our current moment. I have a friend who is a mindfulness teacher. And mindfulness is all about being present where you are in what you're doing and who you're with. Rather than, if I'm talking to Jesse and we're having a conversation, I'm thinking, I got the grocery list. I got to get milk and apples and um, beef and, oh, I got to pick up some of that special chocolate cake, you know, that um, my friend likes. I'm not paying attention to what Jesse is really saying, right? Or I might be missing the nonverbal cues that he is giving. I think that for Zachariah to not have been able to speak for nine months, he was able to pick up on other cues. He noticed things that he would have missed were he yakking or jabbering or talking all the time. Maybe he heard new wisdom from his own wife. That's probably how they got to the name John instead of the family traditional name of Zechariah. Because he was quiet, because he was mindful, he was present, he paid attention more and noticed. So my friend who is the mindfulness teacher has an activity that she does with uh, classes that she runs. And she sends them out into their neighborhood, a place that is familiar, that they have walked day in and day out. They know every store. They know every sign. They know who's coming and going. But this time around, as she sends them out to go on a walk, she sends a picture frame with them. And she says, as you walk through the street or your neighborhood, rather than looking, taking in a 180 degree view, as we typically do if our eyesight is fully functional, hold the picture frame up. 
Because let me step away from the Advent candles. If you can see the Advent candles, what else do you see when you look at the Advent candles? The tree behind it, right? The nativity. The flame. You can probably see the pulpit, maybe the screens even. But what happens if I do this? What do you see now? The light. Mm Mm-hmm gives you a different perspective, right? I love, I, I had chills when I first heard about this activity, and I thought that is so true. Because yes, we can find awe and joy and reverence in the births and the momentous occasions in life, but awe also comes in small things, and it's available to anyone. We don't have to have money to fly across the world. We don't have to have the physical ability to hike up mountains. We just need to allow ourselves to be amazed and to wonder. I, as soon as I got out of the car yesterday in Chico, I'm staying with Corky, um, and she wasn't home yet, and I thought, oh, I'll go down to the, I don't know what it's called, the Greenway? Lindo Channel, thank you. Um, And I collect heart rocks. And as soon as I stepped, so there's a little walkway and the channel is there and there's some grass and um, dirt that I have to walk over. And before I stepped onto the dirt to go down the path, I saw a heart rock and I went, ah, perfect. (laughs) But as I was walking along, I found several heart rocks, but I found these two. And for me, the awe that comes from seeing a rock that takes the shape of a heart or anything else uh, we see brings me to awe. It reminds me that just holding this, I am connected to all that God has created. I'm connected to every creature that has swam across that channel. I'm created, or I'm connected to all people who have walked that same path. I want to end with uh, two um, readings that I think demonstrate awe for me in that small, those small moments. St. Francis of Assisi's poem, The Sacraments, is one of my favorites, describing this connection and the interconnectedness of when we notice and celebrate the awe, the wonder in ordinary, everyday things. I spoke to my friend, an old squirrel, about the sacraments, and he got so excited and ran into a hollow in his tree and came back holding some acorns, an owl feather, and a ribbon he had found. And I just smiled and said, yes, dear, you understand. Everything imparts God's grace. And from uh, Tukararam, an Indian mystic, possibly the most influential in developing um, Marathi literature from um, India. This is his My Lucky Rock, and I think it's perfect for having picked up a rock yesterday. I said to a squirrel, what is it you are carrying? And he said, it's my lucky rock. Isn't it pretty? I held it and said, indeed. I said to God, what is this earth? And God said, it is my lucky rock. Isn't it wondrous? Yes, indeed. When we experience awe, we often want to tell others about it. Just like Mary last week went to seek out Elizabeth when she found out she was pregnant as an unwed mother, because in those days that was absolutely taboo. But finding that connection brought that her and Elizabeth hope in a, re- in a weary world. Our ability to f- see awe, to notice awe, preparing ourselves to be present to what is right in front of us brings us to awe, and that can be a balm for a weary world. Amen. <laughs>